then uh, talk about ethical dimension of inclusive knowledge societies uh, uh, in the context of uh, proposal of Brazil to the last general conference, so to the last executive board, and uh, then uh, speak about uh, or update on our work on digital preservation and media information literacy framework. So the, the, we're planning to make those uh, five or presentations on the five, issue, five issues. But since um, you are not so many, uh, I would like to ask, uh, is there any particular question that would be of uh, interest of the audience or, uh, or you are interested in all, all, all five areas of, um, in all five? Okay, so then we will then we will go through uh, all issues as uh, as they are outlined here, and the first uh, uh, presentation on um, internet governance at the WSIS Plus Ten review event will be done by Cedric Pascholz. Cedric, uh, thank you. <clears throat> In February of this year. Uh, UNESCO hosted the first WSIS Plus 10 review event. Here you see a few photos uh, of the event. We brought together some 1,500 people coming from 130 countries, and we offered uh, some 80 sessions altogether. And it's not us, it was a little bit organized like the IGF, so there are a certain number of sessions which we organized, but there were a number of uh, sessions also organized by others. And uh, we wanted to share with you some of the, the outcomes specifically related to UNESCO's special internet event. Altogether, there were some 17 internet governance related sessions. And, and uh, just to say uh, about the outcome of the, um, this conference, there were of course a number of working papers we published uh, and discussed also online before. And there is a final statement which has been adopted, uh, which includes also some intergovernance uh, aspects. And there were a set of recommendations uh, adopted by stakeholders in their different sessions. And all this is available at unesco.org slash WISIS 2013. Um, just uh, briefly on the four UNESCO special sessions at the, this event. There were, um, there were actually more sessions organized by UNESCO than these four, but they were part of the one-day uh, special session on internet governance, and it, it was about the launch of the Euro-UNESCO World Report. And <clears throat> some of you might have attended. There's a new report which, uh, with a soft launch, uh, which, was, which took place here um, at the AIDS uh, here in Bali. And uh, so it continued, the work continued from there. And we have also had a second session on cultural and linguistic diversity, um, exploring economic and educational aspects of local content, which was co-organized with OECD and ISOC. And we had a session on promoting freedom of expression and privacy on the internet, um, and, and one on digital safety of journalists. Okay, um, so uh, I think uh, for, with regards to the Euro-UNESCO World Report, as I mentioned, there's a new uh, report which, just, which uh, was just uh, softly launched now. There was initially a slower uptake of the IDN registrations uh, than expected, and there were a certain number of challenges faced by those who de deployed IDNs. And that, uh, I mean, the, 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 it was discussed at the session why there wasn't a wide uh, take up, um, widespread uptake of the ID NANDs, and uh, things were discussed like uh, the improved, the need for an improved uh, support in internet browsers and emails, um, the support by and for industry registrars and end user awareness and other challenges. Um, there's also a certain set of technical uh, of recommendations which came out of every session or most sessions. Um, uh, one related to the technical communities, to policy makers and also to, to TLD registrars. Um, I, I think the new report is out online already or it's online, available now. So um, just this week, from starting from this week, you can have the 2013 World Report. Would you like to add something on the report? Or just, no? 
Um, on this uh, second uh, session, co-organized with OECD and ISOC, um, it was really about the cultural and linguistic diversity uh, and exploring economic and educational aspects of local content. Um, and it is, uh, you know, societies have a rich heritage and knowledge base uh, that should be recognized, recorded, and shared for the benefit of people throughout the world. And, um, but much of the world's content uh, remains inaccessible even to local population, and not to mention to a broader level. And uh, so there are many reasons for this content divide, and these were discussed. Uh, at the sessions and the challenges related to it and also of course the recommendations and here you see uh, some recommendations to policy makers but uh, there were, were other also addressing connectivity and equipment recommendations and so on. You can find uh, many of, if you're interested in any of these, also more detailed reports online uh, as provided by the session organizers. So we didn't change it as we thought. We, we took it as the session or organizer gave us the report. So they are also available online if you're interested in any of these uh, topics. So for, for this uh, session, uh, the third one I'm, I'm briefly mentioning is built on the global survey of internet privacy and freedom of expression which came out and addressed major challenges uh, again around uh, online privacy and the impact on freedom of expression. Um, that one, was... One, one copy, if anybody wants it. <laughs> so, uh, and the... Uh, Guy Berger will speak more about the, this this topic, I guess, uh, just briefly after me. And um, uh, so the question was discussed, what can government, civil society, media uh, stakeholders and the private sector do and how to empower users? <coughs> and, um, and it was a discussion then and also reflected in the recommendations about the, uh, the balance between freedom of expression and privacy. Uh, and uh, the importance of educating um, on uh, media and information literacy uh, to protect one's own privacy and freedom of expression and also uh, on, on having more transparency from internet in intermediaries uh, with regards to data access and sharing practices. My last I want to briefly present is a uh, workshop was on digital safety of journalists and um, and there are of course a lot of challenges and and again I'm sure Guy Berger will address more of these uh, uh, in, in his presentation just afterwards. But um, it is about uh, the uh, it was about the endangering of the safety of journalists, of bloggers, and citizens. And some of you might have attended a session related to that here in in Bali too. And, uh, and perhaps also misperceptions around digital safety, even though it might have changed with Snowden. And I think there's a w an awareness uh, which was raised um, about uh, this uh, concept. And the recommendations included, <coughs> of course, technical training in digital safetyness, uh, safety, but also awareness needed by journalists, by media companies and governments on journalist uh, digital threats. And just to, to give you um, an, an idea, uh, as I mentioned, uh, UNESCO here is another workshop. Uh, there are another 13 other sessions which were internet governance related, which, were, uh, which we hold here in February in, at UNESCO in Paris. And you can see UNESCO organized other sessions, but also ICANN and, uh, and different topics were, were discussed. Here is another set of uh, of discussions and, and some of the discussions continued here too, um, like the right-based principles on the, and the internet. There was even a main session here in Bali. And, uh, and actually in February, the meeting was organized back to back with a prep meeting of the IGF. So a group of the participants were also there. You can see here also from ITU uh, and ISOC on cybersecurity and here another set of sessions. So just to give you an idea of all the different the diversity of topics which were addressed without wanting to go into all the details of these sessions. And um, I'm available for the questions, but that's it as an introduction. 
So thank you, Cedric. Um, just maybe to give a little bit of a broader picture, this event which we organized in February was uh, first of uh, in a series of review events uh, on WSIS plus 10 uh, implementation. So um, we are expecting that at the end of this year, uh, UN General Assembly will adopt resolution uh, describing modalities of, of the final review but the um, event which UNESCO hosted uh, in February was the first uh, in, in this series and uh, was, uh, concentrated, uh, was concentrating more on uh, UNESCO areas of activities and UNESCO responsibilities. The next one will be uh, hosted by ITU. Uh, if uh, nothing will change, it will take place in April in Egypt. And there, uh, the overall review uh, of implementation of all action lines uh, will be addressed um, uh, together with, with the other, other issues, process in ongoing. And if you're interested in process, then please ask questions. Uh, we, can, we can provide you some, uh, some information uh, on this topic. Um, any, any questions on, on the presentation that Cedric gave? If none, then uh, we will uh, move uh, towards next uh, uh, set of questions, and that is th those questions relate on UNESCO's work on freedom of expression, freedom of uh, media, uh, privacy, and uh, role of uh, intermediaries. And the presentation will be given by Director of um, um, uh, Division of Freedom of Expression and Media Development, Mr. Guy Berger. Uh, good morning, everybody. Thank you for coming. So uh, I will focus on a particular project that we are doing at the moment, uh, which is about exactly these issues, and the results we will present at next year's IGF. So uh, we would very much welcome feedback on this concept. We are still, still in the early stages, and uh, we would love to get your, uh, your wisdom on this. So it's a research project into exactly that question of the title, and it's based on this assumption that uh, uh, states have the duty to protect rights, but non-state uh, actors should have the duty to respect them. And this is particularly looking at the freedom of expression issue online. And it comes in the context when there's lots of content online that could be classified in different ways, and this is a kind of model that comes from the UN Special Rapporteur on Freedom of Expression, so he talks about content that may be illegal in terms of international standards, in other words, hate speech, for example, which is inciting people to violence, illegal in terms of national laws, for example, in some countries, blasphemy laws, uh, legal but meriting uh, certain restrictions. So in that case, uh, you could say some, in some countries, adult sex content might be uh, illegal, but it might be restricted to, to certain, for certain purposes. And then you have content that is offensive for some, but it doesn't necessarily attract restrictions. It may be criticism of a, of a political leader or the criticism of the government. So this, uh, uh, this, these categories of content become quite interesting if you are in the space, in the internet, where you have to make decisions about these, about classifying content and about acting accordingly. And the, the associated issue is what terms of reference, what terms of service you have uh, and then also how you act on those terms of service, and particularly in issues where the, you are relating to legal issues, particularly nat national legal issues. So when authorities want certain steps to be taken that could impact on freedom of expression, such as filtering, blocking, uh, removing content, uh, intercepting uh, communications or disclosing. So you can see this whole space is very interesting from a freedom of expression point of view. That's the context in which we, we want to do this research. Um, uh, we also took account that uh, in terms of the private sector's role and its responsibility to respect uh, rights, there are uh, a lot of principles that have been developed uh, which would, I suppose, constitute a body of good practice guidelines. 
And so I've mentioned these here, the, the UN Special Rapporteur, John Ruggie's principles, OECD has principles, Global Network Initiative, an association of the private sector, uh, companies such as Google, Microsoft, uh, and uh, Facebook, uh, who are trying to develop guidelines about how they decide, how they relate to rights-based issues. The European Commission has produced I an ICT sector guideline. So uh, there is a body of stuff out there, and and that's great. The question is, what's actually happening on the ground? Well, uh, particularly in this project, we want to take it that uh, freedom of expression is the norm, and that. Uh, Limits are the exception, and limits have to be legitimate in terms of international standards. So um, what we want to do is look at particularly what happens when uh, people in online space, actors in online space, have to deal with the exceptions. Um, and this also touches on a lot of other issues, because it touches on the intermediary liability, it touches on self-regulatory bodies, um, it touches on whether there's a privatization of censorship taking place, and it, it's primarily also about whether actors in the online space are in conformity with international standards. So if they do make a limitation, it is legitimate and it's not a violation of freedom of expression. In this research that we want to do, we're not looking to produce a, a, a kind of um, an overview of the general uh, state of play. And it's not a quantitative survey, but rather we want to look at some case studies and say, what can we learn? from certain cases. Well, to give you an example, uh, everybody here will remember this famous case of the innocence of Muslims where YouTube, um, which is owned by Google, uh, decided to block access in some countries for certain amounts, amounts of time. So that raised very interesting questions. On what basis did they make those, the, those decisions? Um, why did they block? And, and, and yet they also kept the content there in certain cases. In fact, this was debated at last year's IGF, and that was, that's what partially gave us the idea of, of this. Uh, anyway, so to define the, the intermediaries that we wanted to look at, we took the OEC, OECD's definition, which is online actors who bring together and trans, uh, facilitate uh, transactions on the internet. And this is a very, very wide range because it can, it can cover your ISPs, dom domain name registries, hosting providers, storage providers, including cloud storage, search engines, email messaging providers, e-commerce payment systems, social platforms. Social platforms, obviously social networks, but we also are including mass media who have comment sections or user-generated uh, sections, UGC, user-generated content. So all of them have the possibility or the necessity of dealing with content and figuring out how does this relate to freedom of expression issues. So shaping up this thing a bit more, we, we put out a call for research proposals. We received 28 proposals, which we're busy evaluating. And particularly, that, that covered quite a wide range of things, but particularly we're looking at proposals to research search engines and how they deal with freedom of expression issues. For example, you might know um, in Google in Germany, for example, won't have links to Nazi websites. So the question is, well, what do they do in Turkey if there are websites uh, criticizing Ataturk? Um, is there a difference between their policy on linking to Nazi, uh, uh, respecting the law in Germany, and not respecting the law in, in Turkey? So these are interesting issues. Whether we'll look at Google is another question. I'm just giving that as an, as an illustration. Social media networks. Uh, you know, there have been a lot of debates around there about uh, Facebook and uh, uh, videos of beheadings and, uh, and, and uh, 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 pages that celebrate rape and uh, what is their policy there. Uh, ISPs we'll be looking at. Um, this is interesting in terms of takedown notices and whether um, a particular case can show a certain ISP which was faced with a request to take down content or, black or block or filter and how they responded to it. Uh, domain name suspensions and takedowns is another area that uh, we can look at. And somebody sent in this proposal, which we are, we are pretty interested in. This is basically social curation algorithms. So this is actually where a media uh, a company decides to use technology and users to do gatekeeping, in a sense. And that's not uh, necessarily to violate freedom of speech, but it does have a bearing about what actually comes up to the top. Uh, in terms of preferences. 
So uh, the different um, proposals that, we, that we've received, which we'll eventually decide on one, two, or three uh, uh, people, we'll ask them to set up an advisory committee. So uh, we're interested in experts who can help advise on this thing. And we also are working with some partners, and we're open to more partners who want to join us in this research and also help fund it. And the results will be case studies. And from those case studies, we'll say this, these were the, the lessons that one can learn about policies for these uh, intermediaries and uh, the practices. So that's, I think, uh, what I wanted to say. And we really welcome uh, feedback on what you think of this research project and uh, any suggestions you might have to improve it. Thank you. Thank you, Gert. Uh, thank you, Guy, for for presentation. Now, questions to the audience or reactions. Is anybody uh, willing to ask any questions or or make comments on the presentation on this research project? I don't see any hands up. Shall I wait for a moment? As uh, as Guy uh, said, we're uh, planning the. Uh, we're planning to uh, bring uh, the results of uh, this study to the next IGF meeting um, already with uh, uh, some conclusions and uh, recommendations. So if uh, there aren't any questions or comments at this stage, and I see none, then uh, let me uh, move to the next uh, topic that we wanted to cover uh, during this um, open forum. And that relates to uh, questions of ethics, ethical dimension of information society. The background uh, of this uh, question uh, stems uh, from the, uh, or why we put that uh, on, on the agenda, uh, because uh, in the uh, past executive board meeting, uh, 192nd session of executive board, uh, Brazil, uh, supported by a number of um, uh, delegations, uh, proposed to examine uh, agenda item entitled uh, Ethics and Privacy in uh, Cyberspace. That uh, agenda item was uh, clearly linked uh, to the revelations uh, of Mr. Snowden. And um, uh, the... Uh, question which was, uh, or proposal which was made by a delegation of Brazil and, uh, and sponsors of that uh, agenda item was whether UNESCO should uh, engage in legal process which would lead to uh, adoption of non-binding normative instrument at the uh, 38th General Conference in uh, 2015. But before uh, getting uh, to this, uh, answering that question, let me give you maybe a very brief um, uh, uh, information about uh, UNESCO's work on uh, ethics and uh, uh, inform uh, ethics of information society. That work started actually uh, a while ago. It started in mid 90s when new technologies appeared and um, uh, so, uh, scientists from different parts of the world uh, for the first time identified certain issues which uh, were new, emerging, and uh, linked to the use of technologies uh, which emerged at that time. Um, the, at that time, the work, uh, work uh, uh, got a sort of overarching um, uh, name or title, Info ethics. Uh, UNESCO organized a number of uh, um, expert meetings and uh, three bigger international uh, conferences uh, starting from 95, 97, and uh, all this work led uh, to the debates at the general conference and adoption 
uh, of uh, UNESCO recommendations concerning the promotion and use of multilingualism and universal access in cyberspace. Uh, that was done at the 2003 General Conference and uh, as you know, 2003, it was uh, WSIS, uh, World Summit on Information Society Geneva uh, phase, uh, where uh, ethics of uh, information society was identified as one of um, uh, 11 as work streams that uh, 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 countries governments, uh, other stakeholders, international organizations uh, were asked to uh, develop. In 2005, Tunis Summit uh, decision was made uh, on um, allocation of these tasks to different intergovernmental organizations, international organizations. UNESCO was asked to lead work on uh, six different uh, action lines and um, uh, two of them included uh, related uh, sort of activities. One was uh, action line C9 uh, on media and uh, uh, C10 on ethical dimension of uh, information society. Since then, uh, UNESCO is uh, coordinating this work. Uh, part, uh, partly uh, in implementing action line C10, uh, UNESCO uh, information for all program uh, took up this uh, question and um, uh, organized five regional expert meetings in all parts in, in, in all continents in all parts of the world and these expert um, meetings led to development of IFAP information for all program code of uh, ethics of the information society uh, this uh, code of ethics was for the first time presented to the IFAP Council meeting in 2009 and uh, it was, um, after discussions, it was rejected by the Council uh, with, with the uh, strong argument uh, that many things which uh, were uh, written in the first version of code of ethics were, uh, were going uh, outside the scope of um, uh, UNESCO. Uh, and then Council asked I, uh, IFA Bureau uh, to uh, continue working on the code uh, based on, on the debate which we had in 2009 Council. And um, uh, IFA uh, Council, uh, uh, IFA Bureau uh, streamlined further uh, the document and the uh, document was uh, presented to the UNESCO General Conference in 2011. In 2011, there, were, there was again a very heated debate because uh, uh, ethical uh, issues uh, are intimately linked uh, with the uh, uh, questions related to freedom of expression, uh, to access, uh, to multilingualism, to different aspects, or not different, most probably all aspects of use of internet. And the um, uh, General Conference uh, took note uh, of this code and asked the Director General to um, uh, provide a report uh, how UNESCO could address issues of ethical dimension of information society in very practical sense and practical terms. This document was um, developed in consultations with all member states and presented to uh, 119th uh, session of executive board in 2012. And that uh, document, which of course is publicly available on UNESCO website, uh, contained uh, proposals on um, uh, practical work that organization could do in four areas. First and foremost, building multi-stakeholder partnerships to raise awareness about uh, ethical dimension of information society or ethical questions related to use of internet and strengthen actions in this area. Secondly, uh, to con uh, contribute to the international debate on ethical dimension of access to and use of information. Uh, further, supporting capacity building at national level 
and uh, continue doing necessary research in this area because questions of uh, ethics are uh, fairly complex. They are subjective and therefore it is uh, not so easy to find uh, common grounds which would be acceptable to, to all. Uh, sometimes I, I, I compare these, uh, the easy, these issues, uh, for instance, the, the level of tolerance. The level of tolerance is the uh, uh, same tolerance of pain if one, one can have is different than the tolerance of pain that other can have. The same with speech. One can tolerate uh, 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 free speech of one much more than uh, another, and that is based on uh, uh, education, uh, traditions, uh, uh, cultural perceptions, and, and, and so on. So these are really uh, complex issues, and to find international consensus of them are not so easy. Uh, the work which we, uh, these areas of activities which we proposed and member, member states uh, accepted, uh, in our view, uh, should contribute to better understanding of all complexities surrounding uh, issues of ethical dimension. Um, the, uh, we also uh, would like to point to uh, uh, some other documents uh, of UNESCO which are re very relevant to this discussion about ethics of um, information society or freedom, freedom of expression and uh, f uh, freedom of internet. Uh, these are uh, following a Charter on Preservation of Digital Heritage, uh, which uh, UNESCO General Conference adopted in uh, 2003 at its uh, 32nd session. That was a reflection and analysis by UNESCO on the internet that is a document which was presented to 2011 General Conference describing the, the role of uh, internet in, uh, sorry, the role of UNESCO in the global uh, internet uh, ecosystem and uh, what, we, uh, what and how we can uh, contribute to, uh, to this uh, ecosystem. Uh, that is already mentioned, Executive Board decision on UNESCO and ethical dimension of information society, I, I referred earlier. And then uh, to the current general conference, we, uh, uh, we uh, present uh, the um, uh, world report, uh, world trends on freedom expression and media development, uh, so the, the, the executive summary of this uh, report, which is in last phases of um, um, its uh, development, uh, so will be discussed in upcoming general conference, which is taking place in November this year. So I... Uh, Initial, at, at the beginning of, of this item, I um, uh, said that we are working on, we were uh, asked to examine a question of uh, ethics and um, uh, privacy in cyberspace. Uh, it should be 192nd executive board that examined this question. We had about um, three hours very, very uh, emotional debates. Uh, more than 35 delegations took floor, which is very unusual for the executive board uh, debate. That uh, gives uh, a bit of, of idea how uh, important this is seen at UNESCO. And um, af after two hours of decision making, uh, the compromise solution which was found was uh, to uh, ask Director General prepare a background document uh, which would uh, be examined by the 37th General Conference under agenda item uh, internet-related issues, including access to information and knowledge, freedom of expression, privacy, and ethical dimension of information society. So um, you see that there is a, a deviation from initial uh, title of the uh, Brazilian proposal, and... Um, I think I need not to explain uh, why 
but that, that was with the reason uh, why this title was expanded and uh, why member states, as a compromise, agreed to uh, include uh, four issues to internet, to, uh, which relate to internet use, and that is uh, access to information and knowledge, uh, freedom of expression, uh, privacy, and uh, ethics. So the General Conference uh, will be uh, meeting in uh, starting, uh, starts on 4th of November, and this question uh, will be examined during the uh, Communication Information com uh, Commission meeting on 12th and uh, 13th of November. For those who are uh, interested in uh, that question uh, particularly. So I, I think that I will stop here, and if you have any questions, uh, either about the substance of the uh, uh, proposal or, or issue or about the procedure, now would be the right time to, uh, to raise those questions, uh, make comments, if any. Please, if, let, let me give you a microphone. No, it's just for, for the sake of transcript as well. Thank you and good morning. I'm Naveen from the Egyptian delegation. And my question relates more to what will be discussed at the 37th General Conference in more details. I think you have mentioned a report on world's trend on freedom of expression, as well as the issue that was raised by Brazil and then uh, refined or amended uh, by uh, the other member states. So uh, is it going to be a report and then the question in general? Thank you. So the um, report on uh, World Trends on Freedom of Expression uh, was uh, requested by the decision which was taken in 36 uh, General Conference, in the previous General Conference. And um, uh, this uh, is not linked uh, to Brazilian proposal or discussion on ethics. These are completely separate, uh, separate questions. Simply, it, it happens that they converge uh, and uh, uh, will be discussed at, at the same uh, general conference. Uh, as um, uh, we cannot uh, sort of publish uh, long documents for the general conference, uh, the four-pager is, is uh, um, uh, printed as an information document for the general conference uh, according to uh, uh, procedures and uh, will, be, uh, will not be sp discussed as a separate agenda item, but will be addressed in the general, uh, general debate uh, on communication and information. And uh, no, decisions or, um, uh, yeah, no decisions will be neither proposed nor made. Um, the report itself, as I mentioned, is in the last uh, stage of finalization. Uh, we will uh, present it at one point as soon as it is ready. Uh, maybe early next year or, or, or so we will see. As I, it's not, not ready yet, uh, but we're working uh, on finalization. A Brazilian proposal on ethics uh, is um, to uh, decide whether legal process to um, develop non-binding normative instrument uh, would be desirable or not. So uh, maybe let me explain you uh, these uh, subtleties or, or um, uh, 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 legal aspects. Uh, UNESCO, uh, according to constitution, has two types of normative uh, instruments. One type is legally binding normative instrument, and that is either convention or recommendation. And these, uh, the, the process of development of those legally binding normative instruments are defined by constitution of UNESCO. Uh, the second uh, option or second type of uh, normative instruments are non-binding. And uh, um, the procedure of uh, development of non-binding normative uh, instruments like um, uh, charters, like, uh, no, recommendations was uh, binding. No. Okay, uh, the charters, codes, um, so those uh, still require 
uh, two decisions of General Conference. The first decision of General Conference is to launch the process of elaboration of that non-binding normative instrument. And uh, what Brazilian delegation uh, suggests is that 37th General Conference decides uh, whether we need to embark on that process or not. If, pos if decision is positive, then Director General will uh, organize process leading uh, towards um, elaboration of the normative instrument, non-binding normative instrument. This will be done through series of expert meetings and uh, meetings of member states. And the outcome of uh, those meetings will be presented uh, to the uh, next general conference for endorsement or adoption. If document is not uh, sufficiently mature, then a uh, decision might be made to uh, prolong the process of development of the normative instrument and presentation of one of the next general conferences. So that, that is the procedure which we'll, we will follow in, in, this, in this respect. If uh, upcoming general conference will decide not to launch legal process of development of this non-binding normative instrument, then of course no process will follow and UNESCO will continue uh, working on the, the uh, four areas which I outlined in, uh, in, in, pre, uh, pre, in my presentation. But, and, and this work will not lead to development of uh, normative instrument. So that, that is uh, maybe a little bit long answer to your, to your question. <laughs> so please, sir. So maybe you can help me with the microphone. Hello, my name is Nikolai Haustov. I'm Russian delegation representative. I have uh, two questions, maybe. Uh, the first one, uh, as you know, for the last three months, there were two conferences, UNESCO conferences. The first one, social uh, internet and social cultural transformations uh, in uh, this uh, information society on Sakhalin uh, Russian Federation. And uh, the second in uh, Latvia last week uh, on ethics. Um, and I want to know, maybe the results uh, of this conference uh, will be they included in the uh, document of uh, the 37th uh, general conference and, uh, uh, and maybe you know the results of the Latvian conference. So if it's possible to comment. Yes. Uh, thank you for question. Uh, indeed, the, uh, it just happened that uh, there were two expert meetings, uh, consecutive expert meetings on uh, related issues. One hosted by uh, Russian government in Sahalin, addressing a broader issue of uh, social economic uh, impact of in internet, and uh, the second uh, hosted by uh, government of Latvia. Uh, on uh, ethic, ethical dimension of information society. Those uh, meetings were planned, or these, those expert conferences were planned well before Brazilian proposal, and uh, they are not really related at its origin, but they are related in substance. So, um, as I mentioned, the, the uh, Director General at the 192nd Executive Board was asked to prepare discussion paper. And both uh, conferences uh, or outcomes of both conferences informs Secretariat in preparing this discussion paper, which will be presented to the um, uh, general conference uh, in uh, early November this year. Uh, whether uh, what will be the um, uh, destiny of outcome documents of uh, those two events that depends on uh, host countries because um, uh, the, both meetings were uh, qualified as a category 
four meetings uh, in UNESCO terminology, and that is expert, expert meetings, international expert meetings, and outcomes are not binding, they are kind of uh, informative. So if member states, and this has been the case, uh, would like to present those uh, declarations uh, to the executive board by further endorsement, when they become uh, official documents of UNESCO as intergovernmental organizations. That, of course, is in hands of, of the uh, respective uh, delegations. If they wish to do so, they, they can do it according to existing procedures. But the substance of those documents uh, will find some, some elements, will find reflection in the uh, discussion paper which we are preparing for the, for the general conference. Any further questions? Comments? Please, please. This is why we're here. Yeah, this is so questions. important for us, really. Could you please explain the, the implication of the non-binding uh, legal instruments on the member states? No. I, I never said non-binding legal instruments. Sorry, normative? Non-binding normative instruments. <laughs> okay, I'm still learning this. <laughs> So um, that uh, normative, normative instrument uh, uh, provides uh, or reflects the uh, consensus of member states or experts, or in, in this case mem member states, on uh, any given issue. Uh, since that is non-binding, uh, no government is... Uh, obliged to follow those, uh, that consensus. But it is expected that uh, member states would follow uh, those principles enshrined in those uh, normative documents. It is like volu voluntary standards on the internet. Mm -hmm. So uh, no, no, but nobody uh, formally adheres to them, but everybody is expected to follow them. And, they, and, and everybody, in fact, uh, uh, follow. And then um, I, I think that, if I'm not mistaken, for um, uh, uh, binding normative instruments, the, there is requirement of reporting on their implementation. And on non-binding, there is no requirement of reporting on their, their implementation. Right? That was, I think, it, it is the case. So any other, any further questions? So if, if none, then um, maybe I, I will make, make a little break and I will skip this uh, is, issue for the moment and we will move to uh, media and uh, uh, literacy framework and I will ask my colleague Imgarda Kasinskaita to take the floor on this subject. Thank you, Yanis. Uh, good morning. Uh, here it's missing one word, which is very important. It's media and information literacy. And we would like to share with you our recent developments in this area because we believe that it is a very appropriate place to discuss about um, literate use of Internet, and uh, which includes as well information and media literacy. And um, we are coming up very soon in basically a few weeks' time with a global framework for assessment of media and information literacy. And um, you, uh, this tool will be uh, openly available to everyone. So this is a good opportunity to present and just to highlight some details. So what we see here basically uh, during last several years, during last decade, uh, it was announced UN Decade on Literacy. And a lot of activities took place, a lot of strategies, programs were implemented at national and international level. And what we observe during that decade, um, rates of illiteracy were decreasing in many countries around the world. But at the same time, what we observe that there are new types of illiteracy, such as digital divide and knowledge divide. And it means we need new literacy frameworks or even regimes how to address that type of divide 
and there are a number of discussions around the world among um, experts, um, governmental institutions, researchers, even among individual citizens, what kind of measures and what kind of competences we need to have in order to succeed in uh, future societies. And here you could see very clearly there are a number of, let's say, uh, competing and as well overlapping concepts. And here in the middle we have media literacy and information literacy. We have in some countries like, for example, Russian Federation and, um, and France, it's often used information culture. We, have, we speak as well here a lot uh, in IGF about cyber literacy or internet literacy. So there are not a good mixture of different types of concepts around. Some of them are very new, novel, and some of them are co old, uh, let's say old in terms of what we are really have substantial research done in the past, like for example media literacy or information literacy exists almost uh, more than 40 years, which is very well established discipline and it's taught at universities and uh, many countries um, already have policies uh, in that area. So what you could see, what a new literacy framework is needed for professional life, for individual life, for any kind of community, whether it is a working community or it is a cultural community, linguistic com community, and as well for the issues to deal at societal level. So we are looking for new literacy framework which would help us to, um, to, um, to address the challenges we have today. So let's move on. UNESCO analyzed this concept and we came up to the conclusion that we could use something like a composite concept of media and information literacy. So there are some relevant um, literacies which are combined under one umbrella. So we have as well elements which come from uh, library literacy, from digital literacy, from internet literacy. Yesterday we have heard a term in one of his sessions, internet security issues as well address cultural diversity, basic literacy of course and uh, news literacy and many other types which are related to media and information literacy. So here it is a very short definition and we, what we say is what media and information literacy is a set of competencies. And I would like to highlight what we speak about competencies here because if we just speak about media and information literacy skills, it's not sufficient. We have to have skills, we have to know what we know, so knowledge, and there are certain attitudes which as well include values. Uh, and um, this is what it helps us to access, to retrieve, understand, evaluate, create, use, share information in any kind of format. It could be as well media content in any kind of format and channel uh, using, for example, ICTs in critical, ethical, and efficient manner in order to contribute, participate, and engage in any kind of personal, social, and uh, professional activities. So we believe that with media information literacy, we contribute to the promotion of human rights, particular freedom of expression and access to information. So this is how we frame this concept of media and information literacy. Um, why we decided to, do, uh, to develop a framework, assessment framework? When you have a number of concepts around, you as well need evidence data information, evidence uh, evidence based information for different activities like projects, policy development, and so on. And we could observe during the past years, and it's interesting to say, but this is communiques from Bali, what I use here, uh, which says what a lot of um, actions were taken in the past at uh, different levels, processes for development, which we're not really addressing or having um, accurate data. So we're based basically on basic data or even really anecdotal data. And this is why we believe that in order to move with, uh, literate societies, we need to do assessments prior any kind of planning initiatives. So that is one important element that I would like to highlight. So it is a stimulus for UNESCO to come up with assessment framework. So it's uh, what we come up, we see what we need to look how country is ready to take up ML, short acronym of, of media information literacy, at societal level, institutional level, and individual level. And um, the document which will come up very soon will have two tiers of indicators. So we have one tier of indicator which is country readiness, and it has six major uh, categories of which will help us to evaluate and assess how environment is favorable to media and information literacy. So here you could see uh, education policy, supply, uh, access, use, and civil society aspects. So all of those categories will be assessed 
and we will come up with, um, let's say, level of favorability of media and information literacy in a given country. We believe as well that we have to measure uh, competencies. We have to assess competencies, and it's not easy to assess for every single citizen, so we decided what teachers are those who are between societal level and individual level, and we are knowledge gatekeeper, uh, gatekeepers, and uh, we decided what we come up with a competency framework for teachers, which is composed of three major elements, what you could see here. And we take into consideration teachers who are in service already, we are teaching, and those who are coming up, so basically in training at universities or special schools uh, which uh, basically uh, provide uh, studies for future teachers. And here it is just an example how it looks competency framework. Uh, those who like statistics will find a lot of things in our assessment um, uh, document. But here uh, I can tell you what uh, there are three major competency competencies or components of competencies sorry and uh, there are 114 performance criteria so it's very very comprehensive and we have three levels of proficiency very advanced um, intermediate and basic level of media and information literacy and um, we speak as well that if you do assessment you need a good delivery method so we uh, come up now with paper and pencil uh, survey, but we would like to see in future what we developed something what it is computer-based testing. You could have as well a mixed test, and uh, this is what would bring us to big data at national level, and where you combine what you have as a country, country readiness, and plus you combine with individual competencies. Why we decided to do this, why we decided to have those two tiers of indicators, very often teachers are blamed that we do not teach and train uh, school children properly, but at the same time we cannot do it because we don't have competencies or, any, or there is no enabling environment. So we should not be blamed if there is no environment and maybe certain things have to be, certain activities and um, tools are introduced or resources allocated in order to supply teachers to perform their duties. So here it is a process of national adaptation, which will be, I, I will not discuss it, but we propose what every country uh, which would like to carry um, assessment would adapt with tools at national level. And here uh, is just a general framework how we promote ML at international level. So we have, um, we have recommendations, we have declarations, so it's a normative framework. We have um, a document which is coming as well, policy and strategy guidelines. Uh, we have a number of programs and projects, research going on, advocacy activities, a uh, number of different tools, resources. We built as well capacities, and uh, we have networks and partnerships. And just here very quickly, uh, what kind of tools we have already in place. So you can see um, uh, there are a number of discussion forums. So I just invite you to join, for example, uh, World Summit on Information Society Online Community on Information Literacy, which is expanding and in the future it will be renamed to most likely Multipolity, so just literacy. Um, we have several conferences which took place and uh, several um, declarations were issued, uh, non-binding declarations. Uh, we have a network of universities which is working on, on ML issues where we basically receive a lot of information and um, very good research done which helps us to develop new, new projects. These are the tools which are coming. So uh, ML assessment is one here, but another one it is uh, Media and Information Literacy Policy and Strategy Guidelines. It's coming as well very soon, basically in, in two, three weeks. And these are the I could see, but not everything is here shown. Uh, there are some other documents um, which were published. So if you have any questions and you are interested in this document, you just could send me or my colleague, Alton Grizzle, an email and we reply. And if you have any questions today, I could reply to them. Thank you. So now would be the right time to ask questions to Mgarda, if any on uh, her presentation. Otherwise, uh, 
we will we will put this presentation on UNESCO's website, and I believe it is also accessible through the IGF website um, for those who are trying to capture the, the information on the screen. So that this information will be available. So let me then, if there are no no questions about media information literacy frameworks, let me uh, then go to the last one, please. You have a question, I see. If you could, oh, you're giving the microphone. Very good, thank you. I would like to ask, uh, so far how many countries have adopted the framework? And uh, is there any way to uh, measure uh, as to what status of the adoption, uh, whether the kind of development there, uh, how to measure the, what impact of this uh, adoption towards the the country that adopt this uh, framework? It was not adopted by any country. It is we are launching this framework. Oh. But it was developed in consultation with numerous, numerous number of experts coming from around the world. We have several conferences where we tested uh, the framework. We had as well special workshops where we tested what kind of competencies we have. We had a number of peer reviews. So it was a long process, I would say four years, where we worked on this framework. Uh, what we, the tools will be available to everyone so a country can decide, or even institution, for example, teacher training institution could decide to use competency framework, a part of, of, of a framework, what we propose, and do assessment without adapting it. But what we recommend in order to have very concrete results and see what are the real, real issues on the ground, we still propose to do national adaptation. And if it's needed, UNESCO could assist uh, uh, during this uh, national adaptation process. We do not have delivery method, uh, me, uh, what I referred yeah. to computer-based te uh, testing and uh, mixed testing, but we will supply with uh, pen and uh, pen uh, test and if resources are available, we would be happy to develop an open uh, delivery system. So thank you, Garda. Any further questions? No? Any questions of media information literacy? Then let me move to the uh, uh, area of uh, our work related to uh, digital preservation or present, uh, preservation of um, uh, digital information. That will be uh, relatively short. Uh, I mentioned in, in, at the very beginning, talking about ethics, I mentioned the charter on uh, preservation of uh, documentary heritage, uh, so digital heritage, uh, which was adopted by General Conference in 2003. Uh, this, um, uh, uh, this charter was marked the beginning of uh, UNESCO's engagement uh, in this, on this question, which uh, becomes uh, more and more important every day. As you know, UNESCO is a, a heritage uh, protection organization. Uh, most uh, known uh, area of our work is a, a World Heritage uh, Program. Uh, we have a convention on uh, protection of intangible heritage. And we have a program called Memory of the World, which uh, uh, deals with protection of documentary heritage. And this program exists already 20 years. Uh, but since digital becomes more and more uh, important and uh, uh, basically overtakes every other kind of uh, uh, doc documentary heritage, we think uh, that uh, the focus of uh, work in the future uh, should be clearly to uh, questions related to digital uh, uh, preservation because um, we, after um, reviewing the implementation of Charter of 2003 uh, in 2009, we came to conclusion that uh, governments, despite of existence of the Charter, haven't paid sufficient attention to digital uh, preservation issues and today when almost everything is digital, we see that there isn't a really um, agreed framework of preservation of uh, digital uh, information uh, in, in the world. And when, um, when we're uh, speaking about digital preservation, we mean 
the time span of uh, something uh, 20 to 50 years. We're not talking yet about preservation of uh, uh, digital information for hundreds of years. Um, the complexities are related with the very fast technological development and changing of hardware, uh, software, and operating systems. Uh, in order to address uh, this complex of issues of uh, digitization and digital preservation, UNESCO, together with the partners, International um, Federation of Library Associations, International Council of Archives, uh, but also Google and Microsoft as industry partners organized conference in Vancouver in 2012 called Memory of the World uh, in the Digital Age, um, uh, Digitization and Preservation. The outcome of uh, this uh, conference was uh, Vancouver Declaration, uh, which uh, really outlined uh, the uh, actions that um, um, different stakeholders group group should uh, do in order to promote our understanding uh, uh, on digital preservation. One, one of the points of the Vancouver Declaration was uh, to develop a digital roadmap, UNESCO digital roadmap, and that is to define the role of UNESCO uh, in this global effort uh, to bring um, uh, more clarity uh, about digital preservation. So this um, uh, digital roadmap uh, will be developed uh, at the meeting in The Hague, which is organized by Dutch National Commission to UNESCO. Uh, of course, in cooperation with, with UNESCO, with the IFLA, with the International Council of Archives. And this meeting will take place uh, in, in early December, December this year. The general conference upcoming general conference in November, uh, we'll be uh, talking about um, uh, whether recommendation uh, on strengthening of memory of the world program is needed or not. And uh, our assessment based on a feasibility study made by, by um, UNESCO Secretariat is uh, that um, decision will be made to launch the uh, elaboration of declaration on, on the memory of the world program. And then, of course, this digital roadmap and uh, the recommendation, uh, sorry, digital roadmap will feed in this recommendation and uh, the recommendation will cover also uh, parts of our work related to digital preservation. And um, what, is, what, what are our uh, ambitions in, in this uh, uh, regard? Of course, UNESCO is not a technical organization, but UNESCO has a, a very big uh, convening power. And we see uh, UNESCO as a multi-stakeholder platform where all those organizations, companies, uh, uh, all stakeholders who are interested in questions of uh, uh, promotion of digital preservation would come together and develop uh, whatever is needed uh, agreement uh, in form of standards, technical standards, um, uh, procedural standards, organizational standards, in order to uh, ensure long-term accessibility and long-term preservation of digital heritage. So that is our ambition, to draw maybe uh, approximative parallel, I would, I would say, uh, in, in the questions of digital preservation, UNESCO may play a uh, similar role that ISOC is playing uh, in case of IETF, providing and servicing IETF in developing uh, internet standards. So we, we, we think if everybody agrees that UNESCO could play a similar role for uh, digital preservation. So that brings me to the end of uh, this part of presentation. If you have questions, I would be happy to answer them. I see none. So we are at the end of our presentations. Now the question uh, is whether you have any other questions on any other t topics <laughs> related to UNESCO. Please, please, sir. Uh, hello, my name is uh, Tarek Zaman. I am um, working with, uni with the University of Malaysia, Sarawak. 
uh, and I'm here uh, as an ICF award uh, recipient for this year. We are working on documentation of indigenous botanical knowledge with Penance yeah. community. One of the issue with the digital preservation is, yes, on one side when, uh, I mean, I, I would just like to know, uh, the UNESCO is talking with the governments to work for the digital preservation. On the other side, uh, uh, the governments don't have the access, uh, benefit access and benefit sharing mechanisms with the community, especially where, where they have this or, all oral literatures. So is there any initiative from UNESCO in terms of to sensitize the government or to empower the communities to talk with their government on these type of things? The uh, answer is, is yes, there, there is. We're talking uh, with, with the governments on uh, questions related to digitization uh, and uh, to preservation of uh, uh, heritage, be uh, intangible heritage, cultural heritage, documentary heritage. But of course, UNESCO is not in operations. So we do not do digitization ourselves, and we do not do preservation ourselves. Uh, the issue is, of, of course, very complex, and uh, for governments, um, governments always are uh, confronted with the uh, tough decisions where to allocate funds. And when, when you have competing interests, uh, you need to fund education system, you need to fund uh, police, you need to fund judicial system, you need to fund uh, healthcare system. Then, of course, uh, when it comes to preservation of uh, um, heritage, you, these are always li like, like at, at the very bottom of, of the priority list. Um, nevertheless, we're, we're trying to ad advocate, and one of the arguments that we are using uh, is uh, if you cannot pre preserve for one reason or another the originals of the document, please preserve at least images of the documents that you can then uh, put online and uh, uh, make them accessible. But then, again, if you invest in digitization, please also think about digital preservation because investment in digitization alone is not sufficient because uh, it, it is a risky business. After five, ten years, you may not be able to access digitized heritage uh, simply because of uh, technological evolution and obsolescence of uh, either hardware or software which was used by digitization. So th these are very dynamic processes, and um, what, what we see that there is not sufficient understanding of the risks. And uh, if we have centuries of experience in preserving um, uh, books uh, or, or, or material heritage, then when it comes to digital, our experience is very short. And we do not, we all think that digital is around forever. But in reality, it is at big risk in terms of long-term accessibility and long-term preservation. So we are at this advocacy work. We're doing the policy advice to the governments. But we, we cannot uh, sort of help in terms of physical preservation because of the capacity and, and, and funding. Yes, uh, I'm uh, very much specific uh, on the policy advocacy, not on the government level, but also on the community capacity building level, where the community uh, have the capacity to negotiate with their governments uh, what type of, uh, 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 how to sensitize their government to look on these all type of sensitization. My, my advice would be to, uh, to, uh, to talk to national commissions for UNESCO and uh, ask national commi commissions to, to contact member of the world, uh, people working in member of the world, and to see if uh, any kind of, we could do any fundraising uh, to do uh, capacity building uh, workshops uh, in, in specific country. But that, that, uh, that would be uh, certainly one time effort uh, ra rather than sort of long term, uh, long term technical assistance but through the National Commission. That would be the right channel. 
sorry, the last one. Uh, yes, uh, in terms of uh, like the fundings, I think even the funding is also not that much issues uh, specifically in my scenario. The only thing is the government or the local civil society organization, they don't have the capacity and expertise to go for this uh, type of processes. Thank yeah. you. So uh, through National Commission and uh, Memory of the World uh, program, that, that might be the, the right channel. So any further questions? Please. Hi, I would like to know more about the digital safety for journalists uh, program because uh, because we are journalists, we face threats and in this digital world. So we want to know more about the issues and what the UNESCO is doing. Thank you. Okay, any other questions? So then I take that this will be the last one and I will ask Guy, Guy Berger to answer. Uh, thank you. So uh, UNESCO, um, as I think you, you know from the previous workshops that I, I, you attended, uh, UNESCO is a coordinator of the United Nations Plan of Action on Safety of Journalists and Issue of Impunity, which it covers online and offline. And uh, UNESCO's um, own position also is that uh, the safety of journalists includes the, the media workers and uh, those social media producers who, who are producing a significant amount of journalism. So, uh, of course, everybody has the free, right to freedom of expression, but particularly we are interested in those contributing to public discourse in journalism, if they are in the media or outside the media. And so in the UN Plan of Action, uh, we are encouraging um, the UN system as a whole to uh, monitor, promote, build capacity uh, as regards uh, this issue of safety and the issue of impunity. And then also we work with the governments to do the same thing and with civil society and with uh, regional organizations. So um, in, in several countries this uh, issue uh, of safety is really getting a lot of attention, particularly in Nepal, Pakistan, uh, Iraq and South Sudan but also in other countries. And uh, part of this is we are um, conducting research to assess where are the biggest problems of, of, um, of safety and impunity in terms of uh, uh, what are the statistics of, of, uh, of, of, of the kinds of threats and attacks and also what is happening, what, what are the different constituencies doing to try to um, address this. And in those uh, indicators to measure the safety includes uh, uh, stuff on what is happening with the digital uh, actors. So it then touches on what is happening, for example, with the media houses themselves. Do they have policies as regards digital safety? What is happening with the individuals? So what is their level of safety literacy? And what is the position of the intermediaries as regards uh, literacy in the, or, or safety on the, in the online space? And then using this as a bottom line, we can then measure if there's progress after one year or two years. So this is, I think, an answer to your question. Okay. Yeah, thank you very much. I think we have come to the end of the time allocated for this session. I would like to thank all of you for your interest in the work of UNESCO. And uh, I, uh, as I mentioned, the presentation will be posted on UNESCO website. Maybe as soon as uh, it will be a working day in, uh, in Paris, meaning in two hours and a half from now. And uh, so I uh, invite you to join us next year at the IGF 2014 uh, for the UNESCO Open Forum. Thank you.